Hey, Nick. Hey, Liam. What's the healthiest bee? I don't know. What's the healthiest bee? Vitamin B. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that you're so amused at it. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing else you get such great joy from these puns. I think it's worth, like, taking a photo of my face after I've told the joke. Hello and welcome to EntoCast, lovely listeners. Just thought I'd bring that back. Yeah, I mean, you can't get rid of lovely listeners. Once that can of worms has been opened, they are now lovely listeners. So yeah, hello, and today Nick and I will be discussing Nick's research. So you may remember, if you cast your minds back to episode three, (laughs) when we talked about my work at Bifor and what I'm doing in the forest there. Back in May. (laughs) Back in May, yes. And then, until this point, Nick has been kind of this mysterious enigma. What does he do? Does he do any real work, or does he just make funny podcasts? He doesn't do any real work. I can give, tell you that for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure our listeners will disagree when they start to hear about some of the stuff that you've been working on. So, just to start off, would you give us a brief overview? What is it that you do? So I'll start off by saying I'm doing a PhD. My PhD is at the University of Birmingham with my supervisor, Scott Hayward. And the main aim of my PhD is to get the red mason bee, Osmia bicornis, to be as happy as Larry so it produces lots of offspring and it is a commercially viable pollinator. And I think that's the key point because I work with an industrial partner Many of our listeners may be aware of this additional partner, which is uh, BioBest. Uh, they are the guys, I always describe them as the guys who mass produce bumblebees, but that's probably a bit unfair because they do lots of other things too. So they produce um, bumblebees for pollination services. They also produce uh, natural enemies for pest control. And they do a whole range of other things as well. And one of the things they're really interested in is expanding from just uh, providing bumblebees to providing other types of bees as well. And one of the bees they've decided to focus on is Osmia bicornis. It's a solitary bee. It's a very good pollinator of orchards and it's quite a generalist bee as well and it's quite common. So those attributes mean that it's probably quite a good candidate for commercialization because it'll probably be quite good in the sort of environments where people would buy it for commercially. So the main aim of my project is to find out how to make it a commercially viable opportunity because at the moment the way Osmia bicornist is... uh, not generated, but utilised Utilised for commercial purposes, is trap nests are put out and they'll take the cocoons that are laid in there. Just incidentally, they put up nests which are going to be attractive to these bees. and Just the wild ones which are around in the area. Just the wild ones that are around in the area. And the hope is that some of them will come and they will lay their eggs in there and they'll produce, and they'll produce more bees. And then you harvest those cocoons later on. Uh, the trouble with that is it's a little bit uh, unpredictable because you have all the stochastic, all the random changes in the environment um, and you also have problems of year to year, it can be massively different the numbers you'll get. Mm. I mean, you, you can get good numbers. A lot of these people, they've worked for years with like similar farmers and they give the nests up to farmers and they take the bees back and da 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 But... Um, it's a little bit unpredictable of a thing. So we're trying to see if it's possible to make it so we can rear it in a way where there's not going to be this random fluctuations in the population. We want to try and make a stable population. I guess one of the other key things is as well is um, Osmia bicornis has a obligate diapause. So that means that there's no way around it. It has to overwinter which is a little bit of a problem because with uh, bumblebees, you can make them avert their diapores, so they'll just produce another colony. But for the red mason bee, it's not really an option, as far as we know, anyway. And So we're just having one population every year? Yes, yeah, so it's strictly univoltine, which means it has one population every year, and... There's only a short window in which it is actually available for pollination. So with the expertise in our lab, because if the listeners remember the winter episode, 
Scott is obviously an expert in overwintering and cold tolerance, so we wanted to see if there's any way to manipulate this diapause to either shorten it or even lengthen it as well, because while diapause seems a bit annoying that we don't have these bees available for this set amount of time while they are diapausing, it also presents an opportunity, because if we're able to extend that, um, then we can keep bees on the shelf and like bring them out when we want. That is the key idea as well. And this sort of thing has been done in closely related bees, so Megacali rotundata has been stored successfully for about two years under various different conditions. So it does seem like it might be possible to manipulate that diapause. And then the advantage being then we could perhaps bring it out at different times of the year as well and have like a continual supply of bees just to use for pollinating crops. Yeah, so that's the idea. I think the thing it would be that these bees will be reared in like one location, like mm-hmm. probably at the BioBest f- facility, and then you want to make sure that they're going to be able to be utilised by different growers. And the trouble is with a lot of blooms of a lot of orchards is it's very short, so you need to have the bees there and ready to go by the time the bloom arrives, otherwise uh, you might miss it. So yeah, there's part of it is that, and it's also just trying to meet the expectations of growers, and also it's just interesting from sort of climate change perspective to investigate the overwintering which we don't know that much about and see if there's any ways that it can be extended or lengthened or what are the effects of trying to do that as well because almost using osmia as a nice model to see how it could affect things in general yeah i mean it's a good model for obligate diapause because it's got a pain in the ass diapause um <laughs> i've been working on this for a couple of years folks so uh, i may seem a bit annoyed but it's a lovely bee um <laughs> uh, and so yeah things that we do for this bee may be applicable for other species i'll be hesitant to suggest it'll be applicable for all species with an obligate diapause but it can at least give us some indication of what might be happening for instance I'm trying some experiments to uh, shorten the diapause by changing the length that they experience winter. Um, And obviously this is interesting from a commercial perspective, but it's also interesting from a climate change perspective because winter may well be shortened um, in the climate change scenario and we can see what the effects on the bee will be. So what kind of effects have you been finding? I think, generally speaking, I found that messing around with Osmia's diapause seems to be not a good idea. Yeah. Um, so my experiments extending it and shortening it seem to have had negative effects on the longevity of the bee, which is an indicator of the bee health. Um, so as I was saying, after they've come out of the diapause, after you've messed around with the period, they're not so healthy, they're maybe not living so long, that kind of thing? Yeah, basically. Um, it also, like, we're getting a little bit into anecdotal territory now, but... Um, <laughs> that's uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, it's a podcast. <laughs> um, my experiment's trying to rear these as bees um, to produce more offspring and things seems to indicate that when you mess around with their diapause as well, they're not interested in foraging. They're not really interested in trying to provision for offspring. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a good idea. And this may be the fact that they're just less healthy because of what's happened, and so they're unable to, or it may be that they have a strict programme, and if you mess with that programme, it messes with everything that happens after it. A bit like when I don't get enough sleep and I wake up and I'm all over the place in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much how it is. Like These bees are either not getting enough sleep or too much sleep and yeah. it's just messing them up. <laughs> cool. So do you have any uh, kind of idea or, or theories or hypothesis, I should say, as to why messing around with the temperature that the, and the length of time that these bees are overwintering for may affect them physiologically? Yeah, so there's a couple of things um, there. So one of the main things is when a lot of insects overwinter, they need big stores of uh, energy. So they normally do this in the form of lipids. And this bee is no exception. They have a big lipid store called the fat body. And what's been well evidenced is that these bees will use up that lipid store um, as they go through overwintering. So if you're extending overwintering, they're just going to be continuing to use up this lipid store which doesn't sound too bad because, you know, once they're out, they can feed probably, but it does seem to have 
a knock-on effect on the um, health of the bee after they come out. It seems they need these resources even just to get to that first flower um, and even to feed for the first time. And also, the other thing could be that these um, lipids, they're, they're involved with hormonal regulation and reproductive fitness as well. So if you mess around a bit with these um, by, for instance, having them at higher temperature than they would normally be when they're overwintering, then perhaps it can have knock-on effects on their reproductive ability too. And there's all sorts of other things as well, like perhaps certain hormonal things will be happening at specific points, and if we're messing with their diapause, are we screwing that up slightly? Um, and there's a whole range of other things. I wouldn't like to say 100% that these things are causing it, but these are things that are sort of well-evidenced that are involved with their overwintering. So uh, what kind of crops do they use uh, this bee for? Yeah, they're used for a range of different crops. Like, as I said, they're mainly orchard pollinators. So apple, uh, pear, cherries, that sort of thing. They're really good for. There's also some evidence that they're useful for oilseed rape. But yeah, they're mainly orchard pollinators. Why this bee? I know, obviously, it's an interesting one. You said it's also, you know, it's quite a nice common one. It's got some variables. But, you know, why not other common bees, like the honeybee or something? Well, the honeybee is highly, highly, highly commercialised already. Like, if I wanted to try and commercialise the honeybee, I'm 9,000 years too late. Um, <laughs> so it's not particularly uh, applicable. And the reason as well for the honeybee is honeybees are great pollinators of a lot of things, but they're not great pollinators of all things. Uh, so the reason we're investigating this bee is because of their utility for orchard pollination. So these bees have been shown to have increased stigma contact with the plant's reproductive parts. Um, and they also just seem to be very, very efficient pollinators. They spend a lot more time in the flowers of these orchard plants. These pollinators are better for certain crops than honeybees are. Hmm. That's really interesting. You've been getting down into the bottom of the problem of what's going on in these bees and how we can maybe alter that. So in general, the results, is this a, a species that can be optimistic for it being commercialised and can be used? Or, you know, uh, are there certain issues that we have to get around before we can mass produce them? I think there are definitely certain issues that we need to get around. So... There have been a couple of problems actually trying to get them to mate and reproduce in artificial conditions. Um, I won't say too much, but basically they don't like it. Um, <laughs> I don't think that gives too much away. I mean, there's certainly the possibility they could be commercialised, and I think this sort of path that Biobest is following of more sort of what I would call rational commercialization is a good one because I think it's fair to say that commercialization of pollinated species can be criticized for a variety of reasons, um, such as the spread of pathogens and things, which have been associated with bumblebees being commercialized across the world, and um, new species invading as well uh, from commercialized. But I think what we're trying to do here is we're trying to commercialize what is already a native species to use in its native region. Um, and I think that's a much better strategy for commercialization. And it also just gives us almost a bit of a uh, backup, I guess, because as I say, there are these stochastic changes. There are sometimes when the population fluctuates and things. So in order to meet pollination services, having the commercialised stock there is useful for that. But there are certainly battles uh, to be waged in terms of commercialising this particular species and other sorts of species. But I think widening the number of species that we do try and commercialise rather than focusing on just a few quote-unquote key species is a better strategy because just having a few species that we're commercialising use everywhere mm. doesn't seem to be especially well thought out in the long run. Yeah, I guess it's not a case of one size fits all. There's an awful big diversity of different systems, so it actually makes sense to have different pollinators going to different crops in different areas. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think... Uh, maybe looking at other different pollinators for this would be a useful exercise. So, for example, there are other bumblebees in uh, China and things that Biobest are now commercialising to use for Chinese producers rather than sending bombus terrestris there, which has been the way a lot of commercial uh, production has done in the past.
And I guess it wouldn't necessarily even have to be bees, would it? I mean, um, there's an awful lot of other non-bee insects which are pollinators. Do you know of any work of uh, other things being commercialised or is this something that maybe needs a bit more exploration? This is something that needs a bit more exploration. One other thing that has been commercialised is uh, there are some hoverflies that have been commercialised. And these are almost the gold standard, I would maybe say, for commercialisation because they not only meet pollination needs, but they also meet pest management needs. So not that much that's been done, surprisingly, considering that, on uh, hoverflies. And I think that would be something that would be worth investigating. And also other fly and dipteran species would be uh, really useful because a lot of these, we have a good grasp of how actually to culture them. So for instance, I also work with the blue bottle fly, uh, Cliffa of Asina, and that is dead easy. Like a monkey could culture it, honestly. <laughs> I mean, a monkey, monkey with a strong nose because they smell something awful. But uh, they're, they're dead easy to culture in mass numbers. And... They can be useful for pollination. There'll be a lot of uh, incidental pollination that they will do, especially just because of the number of them as well. So there's a lot of different species that can maybe be looked at for this sort of commercialization. I'm hesitant to widen it to all species because there'll be some species that won't be effective for. And there are some species that, you know, uh, they don't need to, human interference. They don't need us to sort of come in and commercialise because they probably won't be useful for yeah. us in the first place. And I'm also hesitant to just be very, not utilitarian, but almost mm. like the these species are useful for us, so we should commercialise this and we should only use what is useful because I, I worry sometimes with this sort of um with what i do and also with the ecosystem services argument that we are getting to a place where we're just looking at species for their utility and i don't think that's especially a rational strategy for conservation so maybe we could go towards something more like uh, commercialize some species but then also augmenting or just generally looking after the wild species mm. which ties in with habitat and all those classic kind of conservation. Yeah, I think there will always be scope to augment natural populations and conserve natural populations. I would broaden it out, though, and say by conserving some natural populations, we should also make efforts to conserve uh, populations of insects that aren't useful for necessarily pollination or ecosystem services. And hopefully by making habitat for some of them, we can make habitat for others. But... I would say with this sort of, as I say, rational commercialization, we can almost just make sure that things are kept in balance, uh, where if we have a pretty terrible year, awful weather conditions, and the number of pollinators is very low, we can then use some of the commercial pollination to augment that. And I think there will always be, for anything that provides a service, there will always be a commercial interest there mm. that would like to look into it. And as long as it is done in a way that is rational, so we're not trying to spread diseases, we're not ending up introducing non-natives, then I think there's a scope for that and it should almost be encouraged because science is expensive. So if we can find a way for commercial bodies to be interested in helping with certain species, then that would be very useful. And a lot of the data that I'm producing from trying to commercialise this bee is useful for other purposes as well. So like I said, I made the point of there's a climate change perspective that a lot of my research can tap into. So by trying to commercialise these species, we have to understand a lot more about their biology. And by understanding a lot more about their biology, we can perhaps meet their requirements better in the wild, or at least understand what the trends might be in the future. Mm. And agriculture is a massive industry as well, so it's definitely something that can link up there. Yeah, I mean, agriculture, I mean, farmers love bees. Like, <laughs> if there's one insect farmers love, it is uh, bees and pollinators. So there is definitely a massive thing to link up with there. And I think we've seen in the past few years, like, this massive growth in these agricultural industries with interest in biological control and pollination services as well and i think in a scenario where we have to produce foods in the future for 9 11 billion people however many people it's going to be we have to meet the requirements of agriculture as well so i think this can be help in meeting agriculture's uh, goals 
in producing more food in the future, but in a more sustainable way. I mean, I'd rather that we commercialise some pollinators and we use some pollinators to increase the yield than we necessarily continue down the business as usual route that we've done in the past, where we've just uh, increased the number of fertilisers, increased the amount of pesticides and things, which does work, don't get me wrong, it works. But it may not be a long-term, well-thought-out strategy. Whereas if we commercialise a few pollinator species, I think that would be a better method for mm. increasing yields. Yeah, these pollinators definitely seem like a, a bit of a win-win scenario if we look after them. Yeah, I mean, that's the reason I got interested in this research, because I did my master's in food security, and I really enjoyed it. But I wanted to... A lot of the things that we were talking about, they seemed very hard to either get people interested in doing or there was always some sort of trade-off. And even with this, there'll be trade-offs mm. with um, producing pollinators. But this seemed like the most win-win possible, like trying to augment pollinator populations, trying to increase the awareness and the conservation efforts towards pollinator species, whilst also increasing the yields of agriculture. Because I think a lot of crops even still are pollinator limited. And if this sort of declines um, in pollinator species continue, that could be something we see more and more. I mean, a lot of species that do pollinate farmland are actually doing okay. They're not declining as much as other species. But I think we still have seen uh, range changes and uh, decreases in distribution and abundance. Um, so... Trying to get people interested in that while increasing yields, I think, is a good thing. Okay, so uh, I just wondered if you had, uh, if people obviously interested in this bee, mm -hmm. is there uh, anything they can do to uh, to get involved or maybe augment their own garden populations? Certainly, just monitoring this bee is useful. So if you know what Osmia biconis looks like, please submit records. It's always very useful for how, us. How would we do that? Uh, so if you have the iRecord app, then uh, you can use that. Or you can also go to the Bee Wars website. So that's B-W-A-R-S, uh, beewars.com. And uh, that is a website for the Bees, Wasps and Ants Recording Society where they take all sorts of uh, data and observations about different species in the aculeate. Brilliant. So uh, have you had a chance to look at any of this data and, and kind of see maybe... Any long-term trends in this species, anything like that? Yeah, so I've been having a quick look um, at some of the data from the bee wars. Um, and because I got all of the uh, records that have ever been submitted for Osmia Pycornis, which goes back to, I think it was 1850-something, so wow. there was a record submitted then. I mean, I had to not use that bit of data because there wasn't another record for 20 years, so <laughs> it wasn't especially useful. But I've been looking at that data set and there are some quite interesting trends. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I have proven climate change, I think, with uh, <laughs> some of the data I've been looking at because I've also been combining this with da temperature data. And it looks like temperatures are going up. Uh, so that's, really? I that haven't heard. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't heard either. So that was surprising. So some of the information I found from that. So I've tracked sort of trends in this species from the 70s. And it looks almost like back in the 70s, it used to be a much later species than it is now. So these okay. days, we would characterize Osmia bicornis as a very spring species. It would definitely say this is a spring species. But in the past, it seems like it was much more of a summer species because if you look back and at the trends of when people were first submitting records of this, it looks like back in the 70s, the first records were in May. Now we're looking at first records in March and April. So it's quite a big shift in the time that they're around. I mean, obviously, you have to measure that by the number of records that have submitted to the Bee Wars repository, which there was much less of in the 70s than there are now. But I've weighted the data according to the number of records submitted, and it seems like this trend is still consistent, that 40 years ago, these bees were coming out a lot later than they are now. And I think you can tie that to changes in temperature. 
but it may also be recorder effort. There's just more effort going into it as well. Oh, that's a really interesting trend. Do you think this has any implications for your work and, and your results in terms of how change in times of emerging from diapause may affect the biology of the species? Yeah, so as I said, shortening diapause seems to be pretty bad news for these bees. So if they are, because of temperature changes, suddenly coming out a lot earlier than they ever used to, this may be having detrimental effects on their health. I mean, I wouldn't want to sweep across the board and say that categorically, but there is indications that that may be the case. Um, The other thing is as well that if we are having warmer and shorter winters, that may also be having detrimental effects on the bee because they have very strong cold resistance. So another thing I found is that these guys are super, super cold resistant. And um, they overwinter at very low temperatures. And if they overwinter at higher temperatures, then this causes the same thing that we're talking about, the use of the lipids that they have stored. Um, and so it could be very bad news uh, for the pollinators. And I think that would probably be true for other species as well. So that is an interesting implication of this research. And it also does seem that it's uh, correlated what the temperature is um, in spring with when these bees emerge. But the temperature in winter doesn't have an effect. So if they have a particularly cold or warm winter, it doesn't affect when they emerge. So they will stay in their diapause and they'll still be having all these negative effects of the higher temperature or whatever temperature going on. But in spring the temperature seems to be having an effect on their emergence. So it could be that it's shortening their diapause Mm. or it could be, you know, having other effects on the bee. So if they are quite cold resistant and the temperatures are kind of changing their emergence time, is there also been an associated latitudinal shift? Mm. According to the records I have, higher latitudes mean these bees come out later. It's cold Mm. at higher latitude, makes sense really. So I wouldn't say there's necessarily been a latitudinal shift. If anything, these bees seem to be more common in the south than they ever were before. Um, But potentially in the future, there could be a shift. I think because of the way they overwinter as well, they may not be as sensitive. So for instance, if it's a really hot or cold winter, they're not going to be able to change their range at that point. They're overwintering. Um... And then once they've emerged, they will probably take the nearest nest to them. So I don't know how much the range shifting capacity of this species is. That should be something interesting to look into. If anyone's looking for a PhD, look at the range shifting ability of Osmia bicornis. (laughs) That'd be well interesting. I would be, I would cite the shit out of that. Um. (laughs) Yeah, that's definitely an interesting question because this species has quite a high sight fidelity. Mm. Like I said, they tend to go back to holes near where they emerged this yeah. is why when we put out these trap nests we can kind of um see what we call seed them is when we put the pupa out and then the idea is they'll then start building their own nest in the associated nesting box yeah no definitely and another way going back to the question before to help bees is to try and get into these nests i'd recommend wooden nests uh i have some data that indicates that the plastic nests are not too great um why is that Yeah, so it seems as if the plastic temperatures heat up quite a lot. So when it is warmer, the plastic temperatures will heat up, which you'd expect because it's warmer, but they heat up well beyond what the air temperature is. So if you get temperatures of, say, 20-odd degrees, then the nest itself is going up to about 50 degrees or something like that. So potentially not the best nests in the world for them. Uh, I think the wooden nests would be more suitable but again i haven't investigated that fully so i can't say 100 percent confidence and the, i guess the other thing that's worth saying in, in relation to if there was range shift of this species further northwards associated mm-hmm. with this thing it would be really hard for us to pick up because it could be masked by population changes in general mm-hmm. um, especially for a species which the population is going to be a reflection of the conditions of that year like you said some years we have a lot more because the conditions of the winter and the spring were more suitable and then the, the population one year affects how many will be provisioned for next year 
<clears throat> so there's also a lag effect. And then the other thing is also looking at these old records, I guess there's a lot of big difference in recorder effort nowadays as, as there was back then. Um, more people generally are, are recording. Yeah, more people are generally recording, which is why I add the big caveat onto what I've said. With, mm. There is more effort going mm. into it, so it may be that we're seeing early <laughs> emergences because there are more people who are a, either know what this bee looks like or are looking for it. Mm. Um, so that is the thing, which is why I've tried to weight it based on that. And I guess with the latitude in particular as well, there's also an effect that there's more people tend to look for this bee down south. I mean, that's the same for, for most of our species. We have more recorders on the south coast where there's lots of wildlife and people might be more interested in that. And um, as you go further north, the recorders get fewer and far between. Yeah. I mean, I mean there are fantastic recorders up north, I, I will hasten to add. Um, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I mean, if I wanted to make a very tongue-in-cheek result from the Bee Wars data, it's there's a lot of this bee around London and Birmingham <laughs> and other populated areas. Yeah. I feel that may just be a reflection of recorder effort rather yeah. than anything else. And I guess this is a wider issue with all uh, species recording, is um, the, how we can untangle recorder effort from true distribution and abundance data is yeah. one, of, one of the issues facing recording societies. No, definitely. And I think that's why schemes like the Bee Walks, the, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust are doing are really good things because these they do the same transect every few weeks mm. and they look for specific species and they also measure abundance as well. So I think that efforts like that are kind of where we need to go because distribution is great. But as it tells say, us so much. It only tells us so much, and it's always mm, almost measured by recorder effort as well. Mm. So, for instance, there seems to be very few of a lot of species in the west of Scotland, but I think that's more of a reflection of how few people that are in the west of Scotland rather than necessarily how few species there are there. And have you noticed in the data as well any kind of effects in, in terms of... Um, Could you talking about the whole kind of adult flight period of this bee? Mm -hmm. Do we are there any issues that you can pick up in terms of first emergence, last emergence, um, last observation? Yeah, so I looked at last observation as well, but last observation is a little bit trickier because the bee tends to get a bit discoloured when it's older, so it's harder to identify. Um, and I think people look more for the first emergence than they do necessarily the last emergence. Yeah, I guess it's They'll, a more noteworthy event. It's a more noteworthy event. And also, if you recorded the species once, you may not necessarily do it again later. Mm. Um, so I've got it at this site. I exactly. For this year. Yeah, that's your record for this year. So I think the first emergence data is more reliable than the last mm. emergence. But if taking that into account, it does look like perhaps the season where these bees are available is longer than it was in the past because so it looks like... later last observation and earlier first observation yeah it looks like there's later last observation earlier first observation so looks like sometimes these bees are going all the way until august and it looks like they're emerging sometimes all the way in march so it's potentially quite a long season I mean, obviously, that's not necessarily the same bee. I don't think the same bee is going to be active <laughs> over that whole period. But it Unlikely. looks like the whole season where they're available um, is is longer, which is interesting because I don't think they necessarily have a staggered emergence. There will be some amount of staggering based on just the temperatures that individuals experience, but I don't think there'll be some that just emerge way later than others. Yeah, because I mean, this data is for the entire UK population, so we're yeah. not saying that one individual nest box, they're emerging over that massive range of months. Yeah. Just maybe ones further north, like you said, they tend to be later. So Yeah, exactly. So there could well be some later, but the fact of the trend is that the last emergence seems to be coming later. Mm. Have you got any just musings or hypothesis on, on the potential implications of that? Well, the potential implications of that is, well, if the bee, it depends what they pollinate. In like, fortunately, these bees are quite generalist, so mm. they'll happily pollinate a lot of things. But potentially, it could mean that they are out of sync with uh, things that they have been pollinating in the past. So, if they require certain plants and things, then it's possible that if they're emerging earlier, then they may not be lining up with those plants. I mean, as I say, these bees are quite generalist, so that hopefully isn't the case. Yeah, I mean, I guess the same with all organisms, they've evolved 
to be associated with particular plants, especially bees. I mean, we know bees are highly related to pollen availability, whether they're generalist or specialist, mm. um, polylectic or oglyolectic or monolectic or whatever. Yeah. Um, they'll still be associated with certain plants and there'll be certain essential amino acids that they need to get from the proteins to feed their larva. Yeah. And then if their emergence time is changing under environmental conditions, um, this could be changing disparate to the, how the plants are reacting and then we can yeah. get mismatches. And I guess it's kind of related to some of the stuff that I've been looking at at Bifor and, and how climate change is just generally affecting the timings of these ecological interactions. No, definitely. And I think with these bees in particular, they, they love trees, like mm. tree pollen seems to be their bow. Uh, so <laughs> it does look like the, there may be potential effects there of changing the season. I don't think changing the season necessarily of species is ever going to be a particularly good thing if it is mismatched with mm. other things that they use but as they're generalist there's a potential that they could be using lots of other plants instead so very interesting and very valuable research um i hope you can crack it and uh, in the near future we'll see farms importing hundreds of osmia to to pollinate their apples and all that kind of stuff but uh i think that's all we've got time for today so thank you for telling us a bit more about your research no worries <laughs> uh, as usual you can contact us in all the usual ways uh, entocast at gmail.com and also via the website yeah and uh, don't forget to follow us on twitter at entocast and we're also on instagram because we're cool hip modern people which is at ento underscore cast because we have to have an underscore because Instagram doesn't like us. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, uh, see you next time. Yep, see you guys later. It's bye from me. And it's bye from me. <laughs> ta <Ta-ra. laughs>